All right, everybody. So uh, for those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet yet in person or digitally, my name is David Brownell, and I am the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Jamestown Spallum Tribe. Um, my office is based over in Blinn, but I, I kind of work a little bit all over the place, and, and you'll learn what that's about today. Um, so my presentation today is uh, what is a Tribal Historic Preservation Office? I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do and what, what tribes around the country are, are doing to preserve uh, cultural and historic resources um, and to just give people a, a, a better idea of all the different hats that I wear on a daily basis. Um, so in a general sense, a, a Tribal Historic Preservation Office, um, these were established through a National Park Service program, the Tribal Preservation Program. Uh, which began with a pilot project in 1996 with six tribes. Um, today we have almost 200 tribal historic preservation offices in the United States. Uh, put that in context, we have uh, around 580, I believe, federally recognized tribes. So a little under 50% of the tribes in the country have a tribal historic preservation office. Um, to put that in a local context, um, the Ho tribe is actually in the process of hiring a TIPO. The McCall tribe has a, a TIPO, uh, Janine Ledford, <coughs> excuse me, Janine Ledford. Um, to the east, uh, Port Gamble Scalum tribe has a tribal historic preservation officer, Miss Stormy Purser. At the Suquamish tribe, uh, it's Dennis Luark. Uh, down at the Skokomish tribe, it's Chris Miller. So qu quite a few of the tribes in Western Washington have TIPOs, I'd say around 50%. Um, and what we do is essentially um, step into the role that's usually uh, done by the State Historic Preservation Officer, SHPO. Um, we perform that role on tribal reservation and trust lands. So. Um, the way that that's set up is a tribe applies to the National Park Service's TIPO program. Uh, we applied back in 2018, and it was about a 63 or 64 page application. It's a pretty um, drawn out process. But once you successfully submitted a uh, application to the National Park Service and it's signed off by the Secretary of the Interior, um, the tribe enters into a memorandum of agreement with the National Park Service that basically outlines the, the duties that a TIPO is responsible for and then sets up a reporting program so that every year I submit an annual report to the National Park Service um, and they review it and then uh, that makes us eligible for the next year in TIPO funding. Um, and what basically happens is every year um, a certain amount of money is apportioned through the congressional budget process to uh, the National Park Service and the Historic Preservation Fund. And that Historic Preservation Fund is used to fund uh, a very wide variety of uh, historic preservation programs in the US. Part of that is dedicated to the tribal preservation program. And so each tribe that has a TIPO receives an apportionment of funding from the National Park Service uh, that, that's roughly about the amount to cover my salary for the tribe. Um, so it, it's broken out evenly amongst all of the tribes who have TIPOs and then the leftover funding on top of that is apportioned out to the, tri the tribes by the size of the reservation base. So if you think of some of the tribes like down in the Southwest, um, Navajo have a massive reservation base. Um, a lot of the tribes in Oklahoma have very large reservations, so they tend to get that, um, that overage apportionment of the, the historic preservation funds because of their lands. Um, and just for reference, the, the photo on the top here is actually a photo of the village at the mouth of Chimicum Creek around the turn of the 20th century. So what do I do within that uh, memorandum of agreement we have with the National Park Service. I have a, I have a couple responsibilities, but these are the, the big five. Um, I'm responsible for government to government consultation uh, to ensure compliance with section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, uh, Washington Executive Order 0505 and other regulations. Um, Washington Executive Order 0505 
passed by uh, Governor Gregoire uh, 10, 15 years ago. We're actually in the process of having that executive order codified into state law. Um, and, and it's essentially a state version of uh, Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, which uh, basically says any uh, federal agency or any project or agency receiving funding from a federal agency is responsible for consulting with Native American tribes and affected parties for adverse impacts to cultural and historic resources by those projects. So anytime there's a project out here that's funded by say USDA, Department of Commerce, um, federal uh, highways, um, and then on the state side uh, by WashDOT, by Department of Ecology, um, all of those projects are subject to review by affected tribes. And I'll show you a map in another slide that shows you what that area is. Um, but uh, it's a pretty constant flow of projects and I'll, I'll talk about that more. Um, the other really big uh, responsibility that I carry is uh, for con consulting for the return of ancestral remains to the tribe. Um, through the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act and then our Washington state laws um, regarding that. And I'm gonna talk all, about all of these items in more detail. Uh, I manage all of the tribe's archival and archeological collections for conservation, curation and research purposes. I uh, protect significant archeological and cultural sites like Tenoes Rock and I work a lot over in our tribal cemetery um, and then I do a lot of education and outreach like this program that I'm doing today. So in terms of uh, project consultation, you can see this little chart at the bottom shows you that um, every year it, it's steadily increasing. I, I remember back uh, when I started working in this field 10, 11 years ago, it was for the Seminole Tribe of Florida, uh, their TIPO office. And, and there was actually a slow season in, in November, December, January around the holidays. And it seems like nowadays things never slow down. Um, but so roughly speaking, you know, around 350 to 400 projects I review a year um, for potential impacts to historic and prehistoric resources. I ensure compliance with all federal, state and tribal historic preservation laws and regulations. Um, the photo that you see on the right side of the screen um, is actually when I was out with our uh, Washington Department of Natural Resources prior to a timber harvest um, in the Dungeness River Valley. And you can see that's a culturally modified Western red cedar with a bark scar going up the middle of it from um, harvesting cedar bark for weaving purposes. So uh, it's just one example of every time that they're going to DNR goes out and does it timber harvest. Um, there's a cultural resources survey, the tribes are consulted and then um, if resources are identified, for example, these trees, then I go out there with DNR and we come up with a plan on uh, how to protect those trees. And then in the, the unfortunate circumstances where say, um, it's the only place that they can put in an in ingress and uh, egress access road and, and the tree has to be destroyed, then we'll try to do um, some dendrochronology studies and, and get some core samples from that tree to at least get data on um, how old that tree is, how long ago the bark was harvested from it, um, some information like that. So this, this gives you a sense of the idea of uh, the, the geographic scope on which I consult. And realistically, the, the blue shaded area is the area for which I receive consultation. Um, in actuality, that, that area should go all the way out to the West End. I do get consultation correspondence for projects out um, on the Pacific coast, but I, I don't respond to those, so I didn't include them in this map. Uh, but, but I actively receive correspondence from that blue area. And then the area that I've highlighted in red there is the area in which I'm, I'm actively consulting on a daily basis. And so um, you can see that that's actually quite a few, around 1,500 square miles. Uh, and that, that roughly corresponds to the range for which the ancestors of the Jamestown Squalum tribe were actively living, moving, hunting, fishing, um, were active on the landscape. You know, they, they were traveling throughout the Salish Sea in the broader area, um, but the majority of um, their lives were spent within that red shaded area. And so that's sort of where I have to concentrate my efforts. 
um, because A, I'm, I'm only one person, so I, I have limited resources. And B, like I mentioned earlier, you know, there's, there's typos to the east and west of me. And so um, the sliver that's highlighted here in red, it, it's important to note that just to the east of me is the area for which um, Stormy Purser and Dennis Lewark consult for, for Campbell, Squalum, and Suquamish tribe. And then to the west, um, Lower Elwha has a tribal archeologist named Bill White who does their consultation. And then out at Macaw, it's Janine Ledford. Um, so, you know, we're, we're sovereign tribes, but we're both protecting these cultural resources. And so we can kind of lean on each other um, in that sort of way. And, and we have great professional relationships in that sense. So um, it's good to, good to have folks you can rely on on each side of you. So talking a little bit about uh, ancestral remains repatriation, uh, to put this in context, uh, there was a big uh, push, interest, whatever you want to call it, uh, however you want to term it, in the, uh, the 19th and early 20th century, interest by academics, um, doctors, professors, um, and then just people who, who simply saw Native American remains as curiosities. Um, but people, collectors would come out and essentially dig up tribal cemeteries, um, dig up remains in whole, package them. And then um, the, the biggest violator out here was the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And they dug up um, hundreds of sets of human remains, a gentleman by the name of Harlan Smith, and I use the gentleman very loosely, uh, a guy by the name of Harlan Smith uh, was out here around 1907 and dug up uh, hundreds of Squalum ancestors, packed them into boxes and shipped them off to New York where they sat uh, in a warehouse for around 100 years. Um, some of them did not just sit there, then, then certain individuals were actually um, sold off to other institutions from that point on. Um, so the tribe has been actively working to repatriate these ancestors um, since they were taken away. But, but uh, in this country, there was no legal impetus for these institutions to return these individuals until the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act was passed by Congress. Uh, what that uh, law basically says is any institution, um, academic, uh, government agency, whatever it is, if it receives federal funding and it has collections that contain uh, Native American uh, human remains or uh, what are called funerary objects, so objects that were buried with an individual or objects of cultural patrimony, which were objects that were passed down from generation to generation. Um, and then at some point in time, were usually stolen or coerced off of an individual and taken away from them to put into museums collections. Um, these agencies were responsible for inventorying all of these items and then sending NAGPRA inventories out to federally recognized tribes. Um, so my, my predecessors, Kathy Duncan and Gideon Kaufman, who are both Jamestown tribal citizens, did a ton of work in, in bringing back individuals. Um, Kathy Duncan, starting as far back as uh, the early 2000s, uh, made a trip to New York to the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Uh, and brought back um, a couple hundred individuals from that institution. Then Kathy and I actually traveled down to uh, University of California, Berkeley, the Phoebe Hearst Museum of Anthropology in uh, fall of 20, 2018, 2019, time flies, um, and repatriated the skull of a young woman that was actually removed from that original set that was sent to the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Um, and when we brought her back, we were able to rebury her with the family group that she had originally been removed with. So um, really just trying to bring these ancestors uh, home and, and put them to rest. We have a dedicated plot within the Jamestown Squam Tribal Cemetery that's set aside for these ancestral remains. Um, we do a, a traditional burial with a bentwood cedar box um, in, a, in a private ceremony. Um, and we have, a, we have state laws here in Washington state that, that basically mirror that national NAGPRA law. And so um, every year, you know, it, it varies. We may have um, this past year with, with the COVID pandemic and, and um, 
sort of a slowdown in, in projects and um, in outdoor recreation. You know, we only had two cases this past year, 2020, versus in previous years, we've had as many as, as five or six uh, ancestral repatriations. Um, and what happens is the, the best example here locally is we're, we're currently engaged in a lot of water quality improvement pro and projects, which involve replacing uh, septic, uh, old septic systems along the coast, be that um, along um, Port, An Port Angeles Harbor, Dungeness Bay. Um, and a lot of these um, septic systems happen to be in places where uh, Native American tribes used to live. And so during those septic replacement projects, if cultural remains are identified, the tribes will be notified. As much as possible, we try to rebury or keep individuals in their, their original place of interment. Um, you know, with, with septic projects as an example, you know, we're sometimes stuck with, um, there's only a small amount of space where we can put that. And so that individual has to be um, exhumed and then reburied in the Jamestown Cemetery. Um, so we're again doing um, anywhere between you know two to two to ten ancestral reburials a year, um, depending on what's going on. And then we still have, to my knowledge, I believe one outstanding uh, set of Nagpur remains that we're planning on bringing back. Um, COVID again kind of threw a wrench in things, but but it's it's a constant process. Um, one of the other parts of my job that I, I really, really enjoy is the collections management side of it. So uh, my, my background, uh, my graduate degree is in public history and specializing in archiving. So that's sort of my personal passion. And we set up uh, uh, tribal archives for the Jamestown tribe back in 2018, 2019. Um, we also have an extensive collection of archaeological and uh, museum objects. So uh, we have everything from the Squim Bypass and Washington Harbor archaeological collections, which are tens of thousands of archaeological artifacts. We have ethnographic collections belonging to the tribe of, of baskets, wooden carvings, drums, um, combs, you name it, those sort of items. And so a, a big part of my job is uh, as we actively receive some of these archaeological collections from different agencies or individuals, I have a whole process set up where as I receive that collection, it has to go into isolation for a certain period of time just to make sure that any um, sort of uh, pest, insects, et cetera, um, that might be on it, you know, we set it aside somewhere for a couple weeks to make sure anything like that um, is going to have a harder time to survive. We go through the individual items. Um, sometimes they need a little brushing or cleaning. Uh, we accession the collection, catalog each of the items. Um, if they need some conservation or stabilization, we can house them in a special um, box or what have you, uh, storage and exhibitor photography. And you can see in these photos sort of the, the steps of that process. So the photo um, second from the top left is one of my interns filling out a catalog form. Um, you can see she's got a uh, antler tine that's been uh, sharpened into um, sort of a bone point or all there. Uh, each individual artifact has a catalog form completed. The photo to the right of the intern is actually what those collections looked like when we received them. So sort of a horror story, a box filled with paper and Ziploc baggies just filled willy-nilly with um, tons of faunal remains and artifacts. And so we sort through all of those and then you can see in the photo on the top right, um, for the most part, uh, they're individually bagged. Each has a bag tag, and then the bag itself is labeled to correspond with the catalog record. And then the catalog forms, we, um, we scan those. So we have them. Uh, redundancy is the key here, because you don't want to lose any of this work after you do it. So um, having two or three copies of all of this work. So uh, this map gives you an idea of just some of the what the locations of some of the collections that we uh, curate. So the Squim Bypass sites are the two red stars on the far left on the map. They're right kind of central Squim and then just to the east of the Dungeness River. Um, if you remember the, the Squim, when they put in the Highway 101 bypass just south of Squim, there was a large uh, archaeological excavation sponsored by WashDOT. 
um, and it was primarily two large archaeological sites, 45CA426 and 433 are the Smithsonian trinomial designations for those sites. And they are um, really cool. The, the site, uh, the, the primary site 426, which is the one right at the um, Squim Avenue and Highway 101 interchange in Squim is a two component site. The older component, which was on a terrace um, overlooking the Dungeness River Paleo Channel that became the Bell Creek Channel, um, was basically a hunting camp occupied at least six to 8,000 years ago, um, probably semi contemporaneous with the later occupations of the Manus Mastodon site. So basically, a, a hunting camp overlooking the Swim Prairie. And then the lower component was a um, a 2,700 year old to 170 year old um, hunting camp that had, uh, we had ground slate uh, knife and projectile points. Um, we had two pit houses that were fully excavated and potentially a third pit house that was partially excavated that had tool production areas, including quartz microblades, um, the ground slate points that I mentioned, day site flaked projectile points, um, ground bone tools, and the primary uh, occupation of those sites was centered around the hunting and processing of deer and elk, um, which no big surprise there, but also hunting, um, you know, bear, uh, any sort of birds or small mammals out on the prairie. Uh, there was also, they did uh, some really great ethnobotanical um, and paleobotanical uh, analyses and found um, primarily a lot of a Douglas fir and alder um, cook fire remains, but also a lot of our um, native berries. So salmon berry, trailing blackberry, um, elderberry, and then camas as well. So um, basically each of these pit houses had um, both uh, fire pits, which were basically the shallow lenses of charcoal and then deeper cooking pits for um, camas. And then they also had like some clamshell and salmon bones. So they're eating a little bit of everything at that site. Uh, those two sites on the Squim Prairie are closely associated with the Shaquing Village site, which is the star right there at the entrance to Squim, uh, Squim Bay. Uh, Shaquing was a, a large uh, Squalum Village site occupied up through the, the very late 1800s. Um, then became that site became the Buggy Clam Cannery, which is now today the Battelle Marine Sciences Laboratory. Um, so we work closely with Department of Energy Pacific Northwest National Laboratories. We've done additional archaeological field work out there in 2019. Um, found some really cool stuff, including um, etched pebbles that met, match those that were found at the Chuitzen site there in, in Port Angeles back 15, 20 years ago. Um, we also curate a large number of collections from uh, Indian Island, NASMAG Indian Island, which today is a, a naval magazine. Um, basically, when the ships come in, um, Navy ships come in, they drop off their munitions there at Indian Island before they sail further into um, Kitsap Bangor or uh, Bremerton. Uh, Indian Island was occupied uh, by Slalom families as late as 1938 when the Navy bought the island. Um, the Prince family and the Patsy family, as well as some other Slalom families, still owned land on Indian Island at that time um, and then moved to Jamestown. So uh, we curate a large number of collections uh, from that island, and I believe Port Gamble Slalom also curate a few collections from there as well. Um, and those, those collections are actually owned by the Navy and then um, technically they're on loan to the tribe. So we curate them on loan on, on behalf of the Navy. And this is a photo of what those collections look like. So our archeological collection storage unit, as you can see, I am up to my teeth in it. Um, so that's, that's part of our long range planning at the tribe is looking into what, what our needs are for a long-term uh, curation facility. Um, but that's, you know, that's a very big project. Uh, so the, the boxes that you're looking at here, you can kind of color code it. The dark brown boxes with the big white labels, that's all of the squim bypass uh, stuff. So you can see um, roughly around 110, 120 linear feet of boxes from that site. 
Um, all of the light blue and light brown boxes, those are Navy collections. So you can see we have really extensive collections from Indian Island, um, primarily the sites on Wayland Point um, and there on the spits at the, the northeast and northwest uh, tips of the island. And then the, the photo in the bottom left, you can see that shelving unit in the back corner with all of the odd sized and flat boxes. Those are our ethnographic collections that I mentioned earlier that have um, drums, baskets, uh, carved objects, clothing, uh, memorabilia, uh, a very wide variety of items that we will be putting on exhibit. We're very excited uh, to be currently working on our plans for expanding our tribal library in Blinn. We received a 2019 Institute of Museum and Library Services grant for $150,000 to build an exhibit space in our expanded tribal library. Um, so that's something that I'm, I'm currently working with our consultants on our uh, actual the exhibits for that space. Um, and so be able to come out and check a, a lot of these items out in person. Uh, hopefully we'll be opening that in uh, fall of 2022. Uh, so this is the, the tribal archives, which we just uh, built in 2018, kind of opened in 2019. Um, took this photo about a year ago, so it's filled up a lot since, since then, but you can see um, just a very basic bare bones space to help me start storing um, just the wealth of collections that the tribe has. So, um, you know, like any other agency or institution, what happens over time is a lot of stuff gets tucked into nooks and crannies, especially in basements, um, and sort of forgotten about. And then once somebody found out that I was, I was actively collecting stuff, the flood began. Um, and so as that snowball picked up steam, I needed a bigger space. Um, before I was, I was basically stashing this stuff in that other collections unit I just stored. And as you saw, I, I did not have much space in there. Um, so we have this, uh, these awesome 14 foot high ceilings so I can stack stuff up 10 feet high. Um, we're actually getting ready to move the majority of our tribal library collections into this archive storage space while we do that, uh, the library expansion construction. So um, it's gonna, it's gonna get a, a lot more packed in before it gets emptied back out. Uh, but we have collections in here um, Specific collections coming from Jamestown Slalom tribal families. Uh, then we have uh, more general collections that are just tribal government uh, records and, and uh, tribal historical documents. Um, and then you can see in the photo on the right side, the filing cabinets and the shelving units next to it, the, the photograph. We have tons of photographs um, going back we have quite a few uh, really old historic photographs, which are great, but like all of those black boxes you see there are from all of the tribal programs going back to like the 1980s, 1990s to present. Um, so really great photos of um, tribal adults today when they were kids in the, in the tribal programs when the tribe was first steadily recognized and getting those programs started. Um, you can see the flat, uh, large format boxes. We have historic maps. Um, a ton of periodicals, articles, newspapers, um, old materials like that. So part of my job is um, a lot of these materials are available for researchers and the public. Um, because this unit is um, in a private storage unit owned by the tribe, what I ask is that um, anybody interested in researching specific topics, email me. Um, let me know what you're interested in, and then we would set up a day for you to come to our Blinn campus and, and go through those materials. Um, but we do have, I, I created a couple finding aids for the uh, archival records that I have processed in our collections, and those are available on our tribal library website um, if you're interested in checking those out. Um, the ones that we have done so far are primarily uh, related to um, the tribe's federal recognition records, um, and a couple other smaller collections. So still a lot of work to do, but um, look at that as job security for me. <laughs> um, so talking a little bit about the different sites that I uh, manage, uh, keep an eye on, uh, whatever you want to call it. So Temenuas Rock, uh, for those of you who have not been to this site, I highly, highly, highly encourage you 
Um, if you're ever headed over to Port Townsend, Shimicum area to please stop by and check it out. Uh, Temenowis Rock is located just east of Anderson Lake State Park. Um, if you look at the map on the left side of your screen, you can actually see part of Anderson Lake there to the left. And that yellow out dotted outline is sort of the, the National Register of Historic Places site boundary for the Temenowis Rock site. Um, but the rock itself is sort of right in the middle of that. And you can see photos here in the center. Um, Temenowis Rock, Temenowis, uh, is a, a Coast Salish, actually a, a Chinook jargon and Coast Salish word. Um, Temenowas meant spirit power, medicine power. So you had um, black Temenowas and red Temenowas were the two different types of uh, medicine. And so Temenowas rock uh, loosely translated means medicine rock um, and was very important, not just for the Squalum and Chimicum tribes, um, but for tribes throughout Western Washington and, and as far east as the Nez Perce would make uh, pilgrimages to the site um, for spiritual purposes that um, it's not really appropriate for me to get into. But this site is of, of great spiritual and cultural importance to the tribe. Back around 2000, a developer had purchased the property um, and was getting ready to develop it into condominiums and townhomes. Uh, when the uh, Port Gamble tribe and Jamestown Squalum tribe informed the developer that Tomenos Rock was on that property and was, was a sacred site, he threatened to dynamite the rock, blow it up. So the tribe scrambled um, and it, uh, we actually built a really great partnership with the Jefferson Land Trust. Um, and so in partnership with the Jefferson Land Trust, the Jamestown tribe acquired the property um, a couple years later, we acquired additional parcel just to the north. So um, today we own around 80 something acres there. That's the Temenowas Rock Sanctuary. Uh, the Jefferson Land Trust holds a conservation easement on the property um, to preserve the wildlife and conservation values out there. Um, and the tribe, we actively manage it. Um, We've had a lot of problems with vandalism. You can see in the bottom uh, middle picture, the I Heart Miranda. That was a pretty famous um, case that made the news uh, back in 2014, a year before I started, um, was a, a freshman at uh, Port Townsend High School, went out and spray painted his girlfriend's name on the rock. Um, it, it was basically a, a local party spot for a very long time. And so a big part of my job for the last five years is doing a lot of education and outreach in the Chimicum and Port Townsend area. Um, we have a lot of signage out there, um, just educating the community. And we've seen a really great positive response um, to that education and to that outreach. And so uh, to, to put it in the best frame of context, you know, when I first started going out there every single time I would pick up an entire trash bag full of beer cans and, and party favors, what have you. Um, today, you know, I, I might find one one beer bottle if I'm lucky. So um, knock on wood when I say that, but, but it definitely seems like we're turning things around out there. Um, the photos that you can see on the far right side of the screen, uh, we actively work with the uh, Washington Conservation Corps and their Dungeness riparian crew um, to do a lot of uh, invasive species removal out there in that area, to do a lot of um, trash removal. There was there was formerly a home site on the property that was removed probably 30 years ago, but we've, we've been removing a lot of debris, old car parts, um, trash, uh, removing a lot of English ivy, periwinkle, uh, Japanese knotweed on the property. Uh, so chipping away at things like that. And then you can see in these photos, having them actually doing some serious trail rehabilitation work. So the, the switchback trail that's actually used to access the rock um, had gone so bad that tribal elders could no longer access the site. And so um, it was really important for us to um, put some energy and, and money invested into making the site re-accessible for the tribal elders who remember going up there as children with their, their parents and grandparents. Um, and so if you go out there today, um, the, there's an access parking lot off of Anderson Lake Road um, and you can walk up the trails and you can see we've got these nice, um, beautiful three, four foot wide, nice uh, even slope trails that'll that get you up and around the rock. Um, absolutely beautiful location. Um, there are still some pockets of 
old growth Douglas fir up and around the rock. So we've got some really unique habitat out there. Um, I've seen some great horned owls. You know, there's, a, there's just a lot of really cool species in that area. Um, then education and outreach, talking, uh, doing presentations like I'm doing today. I'm doing a whole series of these. So I'm doing uh, six of these presentations for the North Olympic History Center this year. Um, every other month as part of this, this speaker series. And then I'm actually doing a speaker series directly through the Jamestown Tribal Library. Um, and that's on the second Thursday of every month at 4 p.m. And you can find the Zoom links for that on the Jamestown Squalum Tribal Library website. Um, when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, I, I go out and do a lot of presentations in person, um, be that to local in public interest groups, school groups, um, et cetera. This photo is from a, a Jefferson Land Trust fundraiser event. Um, but you know, it, it, at the end of the day, cultural resources and historic resources, um, they, in a broadest sense, it, they belong to us all and it behooves us all to protect those resources. And so um, from my perspective, the more educated and informed the public are on the value of these resources um, and, and what to do in, in recognizing those resources and knowing what to do when you encounter them, um, it makes my job a lot easier at the end of the day. And so um, a big part of my job is doing trainings with um, local agencies like the Clallam County Sheriff's Office, um, Prosecutor's Office, uh, Clallam County Health and Human Services, uh, County Parks, City of Squim Police Department, all these local agencies, um, and, and educating um, them on what to keep an eye out for um, and, and sort of what their next steps are to sort of put us all in a better standing to, to deal with these issues. Um, and then my other, my other passion project that I do in, in my dwindling spare time these days is a lot of research and mapping, um, you know, diving down different wormholes on um, documents. If, if any of you were able to tune in um, this past Thursday, I gave a presentation through the Jamestown tribe on ancestral villages of the Jamestown Skalm tribe. So trying to do archival and historic research uh, to better educate us on these, the, the sites of importance to the tribe. So um, the photo in the, the top left is actually the, the sketches that you see. It's a scan of um, one of the pages from Erna Gunther's field notebook. So Erna Gunther was a anthropologist and ethnographer who worked for the University of Washington um, early to mid 20th century. Uh, did really great work and she published a, um, an article, a volume in the University of Washington Anthropological Journal in 1927 called the Clallam Ethnography. And that's sort of been the, the go-to um, ethnographic compendium for the Squalam people the last hundred years. Um, however, um, and I have great things to say about Erna Gunther, but she was a scientist, she was an ethnographer. So everything that she was writing was in um, the most general or broadest sense to apply to the entire Squalum people. Uh, what's been amazing is I went over to the University of Washington archives. Um, we scanned five of her field notebooks from when she was actually out here interviewing tribal elders in the early 1920s um, and basically interviewing them about their memories of um, what the tribal villages and tribal life was like in the 1880s, so in, in their youth. And um, it's just a treasure trove of, of personal information. So instead of reading her Clallam ethnography and getting a bunch of general information on um, the Squalum fished at this site for this period of time and the Squalum cooked this in this way, um, we actually get individual names. So this family owned this fish trap at this fishing location and they travel. So it, it's just much more um, detailed and it's been really great to um, put those pieces together and um, bring that, that, those pieces of history back to the tribe and, and bring ownership of that history back to the tribe. Um, it's been really amazing. 